Today we start a new series. It's a mini series. We're going to be focusing on Jesus. Yes. Is it on the screen? It's called Jesus, the Winner Man. Amen. Tell your neighbor, Jesus, Jesus, the Winner Man. The winner. Jesus, Jesus, the Winner Man. The winner man. Luke chapter 2. There are so many verses, but we are going to read them anyway. Yes. Tell them I'm going to read them anyway. I'm going to read them anyway. Luke chapter 2. Luke mlango wa pili. Mustari wa pili. Mlango wa pili. Kwanzia mustari wa kwanza. Hadi kuteremuka. That's how cows read. You know me at school with cows. How many cows are in the building? Be proud of where you come from. How many cows are in the building? Sema Luke mlango wa pili. You know someone told me. Okay, this is just a joke. Out of this, someone told me one way of knowing a kissy lady is you just spot a lady chewing sugar cane ko barabara bila ku go patao joni mkisi. Kwa dum tu nakula miwa na ogobi na nidem ko barabara tu na na kizitu pa juwa tu yoni mkisi. So Luke chapter two verse one. So if you've seen your neighbor and I just come here and talk happy, we share juwa. Let's read. At that time. At that time, uh-huh. the Roman Emperor mm-hmm. Augustus decreed that the census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. Mm-hmm. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Aha. Uh-huh. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. Mm-hmm. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, mm-hmm. he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He started there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. Mm-hmm. He took to him Mary, his fiancée, who was now obviously pregnant. Aha! And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of clothes and laid him in a manger. Because there was no lodging available for them. Mercy. That's it. There were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. Thank you. Let's jump to verse 25. Verse 25. 25. 25. Uh-huh. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him. And I have revealed to him that he will not die until he has seen the Lord's Messiah. Some people are not reading. Where is your mind? Read. Uh-huh. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to the present, the baby was the Lord of the Lord. Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace. As you have promised. Uh-huh. I have seen your salvation. Uh-huh. Which you have prepared for all people. Uh-huh. He is a light to reveal God to the nations. Mm-hmm. And he is the glory of your people, Israel. Uh-huh. Jesus said, I am for the day that God will be said about him. Mm-hmm. Then Simeon blessed them and he said to Mary, the baby's mother. This child is destined to cause many in this world to fall, but he will be a joy to many others. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce you very soon. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for your word. Speak to us today. Open our eyes that we may behold your glory. Give me the utterance from the tongues of heaven. And allow me to speak your word with clarity and with power. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now this is the story of, of Jesus. I don't know whether you are like me. 
But when I was born, I was introduced to a man who was called Jesus. Now the kind of Jesus who I was introduced to had some attributes and characteristics. Now one characteristic of this man who I was introduced to in Sunday school, he was a man referred to, of course, as Jesus. But now this Jesus was drawn on a wall hanging. And his, uh, and his picture always stayed on the wall of our house. And in this picture, Jesus was pictured seated down, holding a lamb. Have you seen that picture? He's seated down in a serene environment, calm. The environment is so cool, he's seated down and he's holding a lamb. Yeah. Then, the, then the, on, on it, inscriptions are written, let the, children, let the little children come to me. Yeah. That's the kind of Jesus who I was introduced to when I was young. So I was told this Jesus is a very good Jesus. He's quiet, he's nice, he's good, he's lovely, he's caring, he's peaceful, he's quiet, which is true. Another characteristic that I was, I was introduced to, I was told that Jesus is lowly and sweet. Like he's a sweet and a lowly person. Lowly, by lowly I mean a humble person. So just by the picture of how he was seated, it showed how lowly and peaceful he was. That's the Jesus I was introduced to. White. The hair was flowing. He was dressed in a white robe. He had a, 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 a something was lighting a circle was lighting around his, his head. He looked beautiful. His eyes were fierce, like they were cool and good. Just want to, to look at him and behold his beauty. That's the kind of Jesus who I was introduced to in Sunday school. And I know maybe most of you, that's the kind of Jesus you were introduced to. If, that's not, if that is not the Jesus you were introduced to, I don't know what kind of Jesus you were introduced to. Fire and brimstone Jesus. But as I grew older, another Jesus was introduced to me. Now this Jesus who was introduced to me in phase two of life was just not, not an ordinary kind of Jesus. He was an extraordinary Jesus. Now this Jesus was not like the previous Jesus who was lowly, calm, and sweet. In the first place, I was told Jesus loves children who obey their parents. And Jesus dislikes children who disobey their parents. I was told, Ukikulaskari, Jesus will not be happy with you. So I, I grew knowing. Oh, knowing, my God. <laughs> I grew knowing. I grew up knowing that Jesus does not like children who steal from sugar specifically i agree knowing that if you do that jesus will hate you and jesus will not be your friend so i was afraid to steal sugar because i wanted to keep my relationship with this jesus yeah. but of course as a little child you would go and steal and still say jesus <laughs> because you already know you have issues with him but as i grew another jesus was introduced to me now in this stage, this Jesus who was introduced to me was not like the first Jesus, lowly and quiet and all that. Now this Jesus was hanged on a tree, a cross. Now this Jesus was naked. Can you imagine? From the Jesus who was lowly holding a lamb, just to, as you keep growing, another Jesus is brought into your life. And this Jesus is hanged on a cross, naked, almost naked, beaten, blood oozing from his hands, a uh, uh, blood oozing from his head because of the thorny crown on his head. Uh, water oozing from his side because of the spear. Now this is the Jesus I'm introduced to. So I was never told the transition between the lowly Jesus and this other Jesus. So I was caught in mean between trying to understand which Jesus is the true Jesus and which Jesus is the fake Jesus. Yeah. Little did I know in my little understanding that this was the same person, but different seasons of life. Wow. So I was confused. I never knew what to expect with this kind of Jesus. Because yeah. now, honestly speaking, if it were you, and also I know that's the same questions you have, from a lowly Jesus, and the next thing you have is someone hung on a tree. Now, this Jesus also does not like children who, who steal sugar. From their, from their mother's sugar dish. Now, did he steal sugar? That is why his mother allowed him to be crucified. Those are some of the questions that go through your mind at that time because of your limited ability of thought. But he was Jesus anyway. Yeah. On his head of this Jesus was a sign written, the king of the Jew. 
like on the head of the on the cross where he was hung up here. So I was wondering, Jesus, you've been crucified, and then after being crucified, it's being written the king of the Jew. How? Tell neighbor how. How? But he was Jesus anyway. That's the Jesus I was introduced to in the second phase of my life. He was no longer a little child. In the first picture, little children used to surround him. But in this picture, soldiers are surrounding him. Soldiers with weapons, wanting to kill him and destroy him. What was the transition? And because of this, some of us have grown knowing the Jesus we were introduced to. No one bothered to know who Jesus is in their lives. So most of you, the picture you have of Jesus is the first picture of someone seated down, holding a lamb, and children surrounding him. Some of you, those who your parents were harsh, kidogo, and fierce, they introduced the second Jesus before introducing the first Jesus. So you have the picture you have of Jesus is that picture of Jesus hanging on the cross. Hello, neighbor, neighbor. But you have to know Jesus for yourself. So as I grew older, I decided that I might study and know who Jesus is by myself and for myself. So as I kept on growing, I discovered that Jesus is not what I had thought he was. Those two pictures were just a, a sneak peek of who he really was. As I kept on living, I discovered that Jesus is the man whose whole history of the world is split into two because of him. It is Jesus who caused the history of the world to be split into two before Jesus and AD after Jesus. It is because of him that the whole world is split. That is to tell you that he is such an important person in this world and even in your life. You see, when historians are doing their research, for you to appear in the books of history, like someone who has changed history or influenced history, the test that they give is this test. They ask this, what did he, that person, leave to grow? Mahatma Gandhi left something to grow. By leaving something to grow, I mean, what did he cause men to start thinking? Like what trend of thought did he introduce? What did he leave to grow? Did his ideologies remain to grow? Or when he died, everything he died with went away. Like when he died, is those the things that he believed in, the philosophies and the ideas he had, did he go with them? Or do they remain? So with this, Jesus stands tall. Because after he went, he changed the way men think. He changed the way we see things. He changed the way we perceive things. Jesus left something to grow. Jesus dealt with 12 disciples who in turn evangelized to the whole world. And right now as you speak, their product of the 12 disciples is me, one of them, you. We are the products of the 12 disciples whom Jesus interacted with, with three years of life, his ministry. So whatever he left to grow, grew. So that makes you know that Jesus is in a, 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 a premium kind of a person when it comes to the history of the world. The stake that is placed on him is high premium. High value. Tell your neighbor high value. high value. Because whatever he left to grow, grew. His existence brought about some mind change. His existence brought about a new way of thinking. A new way of seeing things. A new way of behaving. A new way of acting. A new way of doing things. His existence introduced a new philosophy. His existence introduced a new religion. Christianity. To those who Christianity is a religion. To some, his existence introduced a relationship. He became a lord and savior to some. He became a judge to some. He became a king to some. He became a friend to some. So whatever he left has grown. Can you remember whatever he left has grown. So by these standards, we can see that Jesus is standing tall. He's standing tall because what, what he left has grown. And has changed minds and influenced societies. You know, when a ship passes, you can easily know the size of the ship by the kind of work it leaves behind. I remember I've been to Mombasa. If you don't see the ship docking and you see the waves, can you tell the size of the ship? Yeah. Me, I can. Because, okay, a movie. 
Unaona vijana wanaanza anga kuonesha wave, alafu wanakuonesha ship. If the wave is too much, the ship is too big. If the wave is too small, the ship is too small. The wave, the kind of waves that a boat causes are different from the waves that a ship causes. So the, the, you can easily tell the size by what is left behind. So you can tell who Jesus was by the kind of work he has left behind. Jesus split history into two. Jesus introduced a new way of thinking. Jesus introduced a new relationship on earth. So that is to tell you the kind of person he is not just a small person. He is an extraordinary person. He is a great person. Jesus is different. So for you to get to know who Jesus is, we have to get down to study and get to know who he really is. Because Jesus is not just statistics. He's not just any other statistics. Jesus is the dominant determinant of statistics. He's not just like any other statistic that walk down the uh, the earth. He is the determinant of statistics. Jesus is not just an ordinary person like any other person on earth. Jesus is the depo- dividing point of life. It is in him that people have their being and move. It is by him that some will go to heaven and some will go to hell. It is by him that some will stand and some will fall. So Jesus is the dividing point of life. So for us to get to know who this Jesus is, let's get down to study. Let's get to know who Jesus is. And let's start from the from the very start. Tell your neighbor, let's start from the very start. If you have your notebook, say this is my notebook. This is my notebook. I take notes. I take notes. This is my notebook. This is my notebook. I take notes. I take if your neighbor doesn't have a notebook, ask them, yo, what's your problem? Ask them what I'm telling them. Ask them that. Everyone should have a notebook. Tell them everyone should have a notebook. And everyone should write down. So let's start from the very start of it all. Let's look at the birth of Jesus. Now the birth of Jesus can be described by one word. Do you want to know what the birth of Jesus can be described by? Are you sure you want to know? The birth of Jesus can be described by the word scandal. So my topic today, my subtopic of this series, the first episode, is scandal. Tell me about scandal. Still a scandal, but still something like that. You see, the birth of Jesus can be described as scandal Because of what he brought into this world and what he came to do. Now, picture this. Jesus is born of a virgin young girl called Mary. Underline the word virgin, then young girl. Who was engaged to a man called Joseph. You see, in the modern world right now, that statement that I just made clicks no bell, like rings no bell in your head. You know why? Young girls are getting pregnant left, right, and center. So when I tell you that he was engaged to a... Jesus came through a virgin Mary, a young girl, engaged to a guy called Joseph. It rings no bell. Because to you, girls getting pregnant is a cup of tea. If anything, some of you here, you've removed three or four abortions, like babies. You've done four. So getting pregnant is not a big deal in our today's world. But in the days of the Jew... And in the close-knit community of Jew, such was termed as scandalous. A young girl called Mary, virgin for that matter, engaged, then now pregnant. How? Such statements were not welcome in that society. You see, what you need to know in those days when you are engaged is like you are married. And there is a night before that your, your parents give you over that your husband comes and tests and see whether you're still a virgin. So he goes in with you. The parents are waiting outside and everyone else. He has sex, then comes out, then is given a, a white cloth. There is put under the bed. Then if the cloth is not oozing with blood, like blood does not stain to it, he brings it and shows like this. They know, oh. That one is not a virgin. And I know most of you, if we give you the cloth and we, and we wait outside, what do we see? Hey, tell your neighbor, you're done now. That's why this does not ring a bell. 
It does not mean anything to you. Mercy. But the truth is, tell anybody the truth is, okay. it was a scandal for Mary. Have we imagined at it? And I come and I'm here as I walk in here, James. I mean, you're going to ball. I'm going to ball your nanny at the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost? Which ghost is this that is going in impregnating young girls around? Which ghost is this one? And I'm getting Holy Ghost. Holy, I'm going to let him pass you. I'm going to pass you. I'm going to pass you. By the way, see, I thought you were engaged to Joseph. What has happened? Is Joseph now called Joseph Holy Ghost? I said, no, I'm a lady. An angel appeared to me. And this angel told me that the power of God will come upon me and overshadow me. Like the Holy Spirit will come upon me and overshadow me. And he shall give me a boy. And I shall call him so and so. Alambia, that is how people who wali cheesy wali anza hivyo. Unasikia? Hini kuchizi mtu wangu. Budaka nawambia, I've been living for like 50 years. In all my 50 years, I have never had such a case. What do you want to tell me? It's not even in the Bible. It's nowhere. Yeah. So who are you to tell me there's a Holy Ghost who is impregnating young girls? Niambie tu kweli. Nia kenudhia. Nita kuachilia. Mary anasema, no, siya kenudhia. Siya wangeshi ya... Kama ni... 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 Haito anaji? Ya siya wa whoever. Like a... Anasema, no, siya wa so and so. Siya kipto. Ni a Holy Ghost. Holy what? So I'm sure people were around. People started talking around and saying, "Okay, man, I a guy. She no call like a damn Holy Ghost. No, I call. You born the Holy Ghost. You born man, I born the Holy Ghost. So what do you okay, man? When kids see that young girl called Mary, wanna kimbi a guy? Holy Ghost in the Uyo. Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, I call a boy. I call a repair be a CC. It was scandalous. It was not something to behold. It was something. It was something to accept. Like you're ta- you're taking a cup of tea. It was something that you had to resist. Even if it were you, I'm so sure you won't be quick to accept it. Me, if I was in the, there in those days, I'd be the first one probably to condemn and say, Mary, it's like someone here comes and tells me, At now, Pastor, I'm pregnant. I ask them, How? You're pregnant? Yes. Who is it? It's the Holy Ghost. I tell you, my friend, I've been a pastor for so long, and I've been pastoring young people, and I know when demons begin to manifest. This is a demon. Come out now! I will not be quick to accept it. It's scandalous. Yeah. So Mary, this is the picture that Mary had. He walks around town and people begin to gossip him. If that's not the case, he goes to his husband, husband, Joseph, and tells him, you are near the babe. Imagine you're on a ball. <laughs> Maybe I'll go make it. Ati? Babe, imagine you're on a ball. You're on a ball. You're on a ball. You're on Babe, unasikia? Ah, uh-uh, umesema? Ati nikola bol. I have never had sex with you. So whose baby is this? Yes. Sh- because you've been cheating on me. Say, no, relax, relax, babe. It's not, I've not been cheating on you. You know, you, I can't cheat with you with God, man. This thing is about, this is from God. So if I was cheating on you, it's God who was cheating on you, not me. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, No. It's from the Holy Ghost. Holy what? You can't be serious. And in those days, it was not the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit was not given to everyone. It's not like these days when you hear the Holy Ghost, you will notice the Holy Spirit because you also have one. In those days, the Holy Spirit was not given to everyone. It was the days of the law. It was the select and you used to come upon and live, not inhabit and stay like in our days. So Joseph would ask, you're not a priest. You're not a prophet. And the Holy Ghost came upon you. And you are a young girl and gave you this. That's what the Bible says. And Joseph thought silently in his heart of leaving this girl. Silently. Without causing a drama. Without causing public this, uh, 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 scandal and, 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 and what is it called? And shame. So silently. I know you're pregnant. But because I don't want to cause you shame, I'm going to leave you slowly. You do this. When do you go? What I mean, back you go, where no shall go. After delivering, I tell you, you go, then come. That's the kind of thought they had. But the Bible says that an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream and told him, Yo, relax. This is my problem. I caused the mess. So I'm going to take up the mess and I'm going to keep it. So that's the kind of atmosphere that Jesus came into the world bringing. So without, without any other, even if it were you, how would you describe that birth? A scandal.
scandal. It is a scandal. It was all over town. At the Holy Newspaper front page, the Holy Ghost who impregnates young girls. Beware. Virgin pregnant. Beware. MMU has Holy Ghost. <laughs> no, just beware. MMU has Holy Ghost. Beware. Queer. There is a young girl called Mary. They don't give the other. Then they say, read page three. I'm a five things that you do not know about the Holy Ghost. Number six will shock you. <laughs> Mpasho. You go to number six, you see Holy Ghost impregnated Mary. Eh? Holy Ghost impregnated Mary. So it was scandalous. So this kind of circumstance that Mary was in was not an ordinary circumstance. If anything, it was punishable by death. Death of stoning. When a young girl who is Jew becomes pregnant before she's married, she was to be stoned according to the law of Moses to death. So Mary was at the verge of being stoned if she never explained herself well. And if God never came and, decided and said, look, I'm the one who caused this, so please, don't stone her. So she was almost like dying. So she's in such, she, she's in such, ay, she's in such a scenario. So such is the scandal that Jesus brought into the world upon arrival. So when arriving like this, what he brings is a scandal. However, what makes me happy is the response that Mary gave. He said, Lord, be it unto me according to your word, for I'm just but a maid servant. He knew, he knew everything that he was going to go through. He knew everything that he had to pay. But he said, Lord, let it be unto me according to your word, for I'm just but a maid servant. Like, Nyaje, I'm okay. I'm your bed servant. Let it be to me according to your word. You see, Mary saying this, he was simply saying a paraphrased statement of saying, Lord, I know your word, I know your word and your works comes with two edges. Great joy and great pain. But I accept it at whatever cost, personal cost I have to pay. Like I know your word comes with work and your gift and everything comes with two edges, great pain and great joy. But Lord, I still accept it at whatever cost I have to pay. If Mary was living in these days, probably Jesus and Gokwa flashed. Like you would have been aborted. Because nowadays, don't get my hey, hey, and I'm girlfriend, babe. So I'm a demon in a manga, babe. Guy, babe, imagine Holy Ghost had come. Alpha can be a dumbo. Acha ufala endo toyo chitu sai sai. Nanda kupeleka kwenye na tole wango. Eh? So probably if you lived in our days, you would have said the personal cost is too high. I'm not going to take up the cost. So the best I can do, let me flash him out. Probably he'd have been flashed. But Mary said, "Be it unto me." According to your word, for I'm just but your maid servant. Like Lord, I know your work comes with two edges. It comes with good, great joy and great pain. But what, whatever it is, I'm still going to accept it at whatever cost. She accepted Jesus on his own terms, on the terms of Jesus, not on his terms. Have you accepted Jesus on his terms? Or do you want Jesus to accept you at your terms? It's a question. Have you accepted Jesus as it at his own terms, or do you want him to accept you at your own terms? It's a question. Most of us, we give conditions to Jesus. We give preconditions. Jesus, you want me to get saved? Okay, these are the preconditions. Number one, give me a job. Number two, give me a boyfriend. Number three, give me this. And if you do this and this, Lord, then I'll give my life to you. Precondition. You want him to accept you at your terms. There are strings attached. But in the case of Jesus, in the case of Mary, he said, Lord, I'm going to accept you at your own terms, regardless of the personal costs. Ask your neighbor, neighbor, have you accepted Jesus as, at his cost? At his own terms, rather? You see, if this was not enough, how he came into this world was not enough, upon being born, he brought in another scandal. When he just arrived like this, there was unrest in the whole country. There was state-sponsored massacre. 
Herod said, kill all the young boys so that you can get this king of the Jew. So his conception is scandalous. His birth is scandalous. People are being killed because of him. When who is this Jesus? That young boys have to suffer. A whole generation are to be killed. Just trying to get who this Jesus is. But because God had an assignment with him, Jesus is taken away. So if that is not enough, when Herod tries to kill him, God says, now make Jesus a refugee. Take him to Egypt. So Jesus had again to be, to go and be, to be hidden in Egypt. He becomes a refugee. Everything about him is from one scandal to another. From one scandal to another. So what is this Jesus about? So he's rushed and hidden in Egypt. In Egypt he's a refugee. But I thought the Bible refers to Jesus as the Prince of Peace. Then he is the Prince of Peace. Why all this strife upon his arrival? Why all this death and all this animosity upon his arrival? Why all this scandal if at all he's the Prince of Peace? But Jesus said, or rather a prophecy was given of him in Luke chapter 2 verse 34. That Simon spoke and said, Simon blessed them and said to Mary, the baby's mother, this child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall, but it will be a great joy to many others. He has been set as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. So Jesus was not coming to bring peace. No wonder he said, I did not come to bring peace. But I came to bring a sword, like war, against a mother and a father, against a child and a sister. You understand? So his arrival is not just to bring peace as you think peace is. He comes to bring war. So when you have Jesus is coming into your life, stop accepting him to bring peace as you think. His peace is coming with some degree of war. You know what kind of war? Your friends will have to begin to speak, speaking about you. Your friends will begin to gossip you. You will have war within you. Because you will be wrestling. That the Bible says, I desire to do this, but my flesh overcomes me and I do this. I do what I don't want to do. War within you, yet you have Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Because this, the way he brings peace is not the way we know peace. The world says, cease fire and there shall be peace. Jesus says, bring fire and there shall be peace. You understand what I'm saying? So Jesus' way is a bit different from our way. His way is not my way. Tell your his way is not my way. As the heavens are far from the earth, so are my ways from your ways. So you've been trying to put Jesus in a box because of how you've been thinking, how you've been conditioned to think. And you expect him to behave and act as you have been told to behave and act. But the truth is, Jesus cannot be put in a box. Even in his arrival, he caused trouble. So even in him coming into your life, he's coming to cause un trouble, unrest. You are not going to be comfortable. It's not going to be business as usual when Jesus comes into your life. When Jesus was crossing through the lake, he slept. And because he was in that boat, there was unrest. Other, other, other fishermen were crossing that, 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 that lake with their boats. And there was no unrest. The waters were still. But Jesus goes in. He's not even doing anything. He just is in the boat and he's seated and asleep. Then because of just him being there, there's unrest. Probably the reason why you are facing so much unrest in your life is not because you're a bad person. It's not because you're wicked. It's not because you are a, I don't know what kind of a person. It's not because you're a fornicator. You are what people say, you're a drunkard. It's not because you don't know your identity. Probably the reason why you're facing all that you're facing is because there's someone called Jesus who is in your boat. He's in your life. Yes. And because he's in your life, there's unrest. Because the circumstances around cannot accept him. Many will reject him. Many will oppose him. Because he's destined to cause the rising and falling of many. The devil knows because Jesus is with you, you are going to rise. And because Jesus is in you, he's going to fall. So he's going to oppose you. The reason why you've been feeling so much unrest is not because you're wicked. It's because you carry someone called Jesus in your life. And this Jesus is the Jesus who causes unrest. He, he, does not, he does not bring stabilization. He comes to bring.
bring unstabilization. Because it is in the unstabilization that the righteousness of God is established. There's a scripture in Isaiah that says, when there shall be darkness and blah, 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 and darkness and, and, and grappling, then the righteousness of God shall be established. It is in those days when there is a shake-up, that there is a discomfort, things are not as they used to be. That is when the rest of God is established. If Jesus came and everything was still, then I guess, they would have killed him so easily. Because it is in those times of trying to chase him that they didn't know where he was. He was by that time, I was going to be a Egyptian. I was going to be a happy. So in those fracas here and there, the righteousness of God was established and Jesus was able to grow. And by the time he's past five years, you can't kill a five-year-old baby easily. But you can kill a one-year, a one-month-old baby easily. The reason why you're going through what you're going through is not because you're bad. It's because the destiny in you is in a fragile position. It is a place where it can easily die. So God is causing unrest so that people will not rest and notice you and kill you. He's causing the unrest as a blanket over your life. The unrest is there to cover you. The uncertainty of your life is there to cover you. It is a camouflage from God to preserve what is in you. Most of you, you are carrying Jesus in you. You are carrying your destinies in you. You are carrying your calling in you. You are carrying your gifts in you. You are carrying your future in you. And because God knows many want to kill you, many want to oppose you, many want to destroy you, he is causing unrest around you. Nothing seems to settle. Nothing seems to be going your way. Nothing seems to be working your way. No, it's not working. It's not going your way because you are a bad person. No, it is going against you because God is using that to cover you up. To keep you. It is, in the mo- it is in the moments of lack that we know Jehovah Jireh. It is in the moments of sickness that we know Jehovah can heal. It is in those moments of trouble that you will face Jesus in another way. Jesus is revealed to you through your crisis. You see, in the moments of crisis, we think that Jesus has left us. But it is in the moments of crisis that we discover that he is always with us. How will you know Jesus is with you? Not unless you become sick and he heals you. How will you know Jesus is with you? Not unless you lack school fees and he provides. How will you know that Jesus is for you and with you and upon you if you don't go through issues that reveal the other side of him? Because that is what he came to do. He he came to cause unrest. He came to cause the rising and falling of many. This child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel. And I can say this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Kenya. Jesus will cause your rising and Jesus will cause your enemies falling. And because God knows your enemies would want to kill you, he's trying to preserve you through causing trouble. So what can we learn? Lessons from the scandal of his birth. What can we learn from his scandal? This scandal, what can we learn? Number one, it is in this scandal that we discover who Jesus is. God is revealed to us through Jesus in this scandal. And one way he's revealed to us, number one, we get to know that he is humble. He is humble. Tell your neighbor, he is humble. You see, Jesus reduced himself to an ovum. Jesus is the king of kings. He is the lord of lords. He is the I am that I am. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He is the giver of life. He is everything that everything can be. Everything was created in him and by him. But this same Jesus reduces himself to an ovum. That he has to fit into the womb of a woman. You see, Jesus would have chosen to come through in any, another, another way. For example, he would have come through a whirlwind. Yeah. He would have come through a fire. In the Old Testament, he used to come through fire. He used to come through whirlwinds. He would have come through a lightning. He would have just have a pep and it disappears. But Jesus decided to shrink himself into an ovum. Can you picture this? The king of kings becoming an ovum. I think that's the highest display of humility. It's like you. 
you're the owner of everything. Probably you are the Uhuru's son. You have everything that you can get in state house. But you decide to become a cleaner at state house. Okay, even a cleaner is higher. What is the lowest we can get? Hmm? Your work is just cleaning the toilet. Yet you are the son of the president in that state house. To me, that's humility. That is reducing yourself to the, to the lowest level possible. So Jesus reducing himself to the level of becoming an ovum is a display of humility. So if Jesus is in you, then why don't you reflect humility? The Bible says he made himself of no reputation. Philippians chapter 2 verse 7. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. Like his divine power, his divine mandate, his glory, his power. And he took up the humble position of a slave and was born as a human when he appeared in human form. Like he reduced himself to that level. The king of kings is entering the world in a meek contrast. You see, ordinarily, the visit of kings is characterized by pomp and glam. Yeah. If you've Google, Google and watch YouTube, where the queen of England goes, the kind of pomp and color. When he came to Kenya, he been, I think he's been Kenya twice. When he came to Kenya, the president had to go and meet him on upon arrival at KIA. Okay, we... We may not be having so many kings in this world, but let's use presidents. President could, could also mean like kings, right? They take that place. They're not kings, but they take the place. So picture Obama coming to Kenya. What fanfare was involved? It was a holiday, my friend. We were given a holiday. I did two days or one day. It was two days. Two days holiday because of Obama. One man. He had how many agents? 3,000 agents. Three months before he came, came to Kenya. There was a ship that was a five-star hospital at Mombasa, his hospital, just in case. Armored vehicles had to be shipped to Kenya before he comes. Some places were to be shut. The airspace of Kenya probably was shut the time he was there. The network was disabled because the arrival of kings ordinarily brings pomp and color. But now the king of kings is coming in a meek contrast. He's coming as an ovum. The only witnesses he had, he never even had so many human witnesses. He had so many animal witnesses. The witnesses that witnessed his, his, his birth were cows, donkeys, sheep. The king of kings, other than having human witnesses, He's having animal witnesses. And shepherds. That is humility to me. Look, he had all the reasons and the abilities to appear on earth and say, yo, I'm the main man. This world is mine. For we know that everything on earth belongs to him. My landlord. Landlord ule mzia meingia mtu wangu. Tax mnalipa kwangu. Rent mnalipa kwangu. But because Jesus is humble, and he clothed himself with no repetition. He decided to come. As an ovum. Through a woman. Adding salt to injury. His other witnesses were shepherds. You see right now. Most of you don't know who shepherds are. Shepherds were relegated in the society. In the Jew community. If you are a shepherd, you are supposed to worship God from the outer court of the temple, not the inner court. Yes. That is the kind of people who Jesus were receiving. That when you are Jesus, you are not going to be a church. It is sinners. No wonder he says he's a friend of sinners. Outsiders. People who don't even, they are not even worthy to lift their hands and say, oh Lord, we love you. According to religious people. And religion. So it is, Jew, it is shepherds who are welcoming him and celebrating him. To me, that's, that's the highest level of humility. And you know why he did this? He decided to come through the lowest way possible that he would not miss any one of us. Because if he came like kings, the rich would gravitate towards him. If he came like whoever, other people would have gravitated towards him. But he came through this way. 
that he may be able to reach the lowest. The Bible says he became poor that I may become rich. Rich in so many ways. Rich in life, rich in health, rich in status, rich in I can, I can reach him. He became poor that I can gain all these things. So we get to see from just from his birth that who Jesus is. He's just not an ordinary man. He's a humble man. Number two. Is it powerful? Are you getting blessed? Are you sure? But why are you so quiet? It is heavy. Okay. You will sink, don't worry. Number two. Upon his death, the scandal of his death reveals to us who he is. He is approachable. Jesus is not the fierce guy who stands by the roadside waiting for you to sin. Jesus is not the kind of guy we were introduced to when we were young. That we can't get to him when we are sinners. That we have to clean ourselves and get to him when we are clean. Jesus is a guy who comes and says, come to me as you are. Come to me with your fornication. Come to me with your addictions. Come to me just as you are. I'm approachable just as you are. Come to me with your lesbianism. Come to me with your homosexuality. Come to me just as you are. Come to me. Because I'm approachable. You see, in the traditional settings, the mention of God invokes all sorts of emotions. And the dominant emotion is fear. To the Jew, they teach their children that when you experience deity, like when you experience God, you must be full of fear. Fear and pain. Remember the experience at the mountain with Moses. When he said, now, you call him Moses, let God speak to you only. We also want to hear from him. And he said, okay, fine. You want to hear from him? Let me go and ask him. Then Moses goes and prays for 40 days and 40 nights. Then he comes back and says, okay, consecrate yourself. Upon the third day, he shall meet you. Then they prepare. The third day they go. Before they get there, they quake on the mountain. The fire on the mountain. They tell him, chale, niaje, uyo mse wako, ongeanga tu na ya alafu kama tupe report. Uwe kuwa reporter, kuwa journalist. Come and report. Because ordinarily speaking, traditionally speaking, when God is mentioned, fear is dominant. Pain is dominant. My friend, when you see Muslims pray, praying, they have to hit their head on the ground like this. I, I think they grow an undo here. Because the mention of God invokes fear. Traditionally speaking. To the Hindus, they are told you have to continually bring an offering. Every time you come to the temple, you must continually bring an offering. And if you don't do that, you will die. So they have to continually take and feed their God who is seated there with seven hands. But the problem is their God does not eat. So they can't put food there. Someone else comes and takes the food, goes and eats. <laughs> then they think their God has eaten. But they still fear him. Because ordinarily speaking, God and mention of him invokes fear. That's the primary emotion that is demonstrated at the mention of his name. But Jesus comes and says, do not fear. Yeah. He not only says that, he comes and says, for God so loved man that he had to come in a way that can easily relate to man without necessarily invoking fear. So he comes through a woman and the woman does not fear. If anything, the woman pushes her out of, her, of his womb, of her womb. He reduces himself to a level of a man so that we can see how approachable he is. John 1.14 says, So the word of God became flesh and made his home among us. He was full of unloving love and faithfulness and we have seen his glory and the glory of the father and the father's son and his only son. Like he became flesh and dwelt among us. God coming and dwelling among you, among us. That's, I think that's, that's the best display of being approachable. Like maybe I'll go and go to your two and say, maybe I'll go to Maybe I'll go to Odi. Maybe I'll go to Babi. Maybe I'll go to, in our days, I'll go to Madrid probably. Maybe I'll go to Matatu. Maybe I'll go to Fanyani. I'll go to Pandabasi. Nganya. 
Yeye alikuwa mtu wa phantom peke yake. <laughs> Maybe alikuwa na bounce akitembea. He was so approachable. He was like an ordinary man. And that's who God is. God is approachable. God is approachable. Remember God is approachable. He is ordinary. He wants you. He's concerned with you. That's why he came through a man. He became flesh and dwelt among us. And we've seen his glory, the glory of only begotten son and the father's glory. God is approachable. The Jesus we know of is not the same Jesus who is in the Bible. The Jesus you are taught of is not the Jesus who is in the Bible because the Jesus in the Bible is approachable. The Jesus you are taught of is the Jesus who is not approachable. He's a Jesus who when you sin, he's waiting for you there. Eh? Nidanganye. Nidanganye. Niliona, ne? Niliona nidanganye. I know what you did. But that's not the Jesus who is in the Bible. The Jesus who is in the Bible is a friend of sinners. He was a friend of tax collectors. My friend tax collectors were hated. Nika Akume. Kanjo. He was a friend of prostitutes. They used to wash his, his feet. When you told me that Jesus is not approachable, he was an enemy to the religious elite, but a friend to sinners. Jesus is your friend. He's not, your, he's not only your master, he is your king, yet your brother. Because he is the firstborn of all creation. And he is the king of kings. So he is my king and my brother. He is my friend and my king. He is my friend, for I am a friend of God. You are a friend of God, Skylar. Jesus is approachable. Number three. Before we go to number three, let me give you just something short. You see, Jesus becoming man is like man becoming fish. You get that? Jesus becoming man is like man becoming fish. Can you imagine you with all your makeup, with all your beauty, you become fish. You become omena. With everything you have, you, you become omena. That is the same thing. Is it easy? Is it nice? Would you feel good? So you will feel reduced. You would even feel, ah, with all my pride, with all my makeup, my hey, man of God, with all my stilettos, I become fish. Mini pico kosufuria. Ah, it's not good. You don't know But God forgo his privileges. He let go his privileges of being king of kings, sitting on the throne of heaven and judging over the whole earth and decided to become man. What can we do for him? He displayed his ability to be approachable. Why don't you display your love for him by approaching him? Number three. What I'm about to tell you, this one will shock you. You'll say, Pastor, you use such words. Yes, because I've seen it in the Bible. Jesus was an, an underdog. Number three will shock you. Underdog. Pastor, Jesus was an underdog. Never to me, your Gina could describe Mungu. You see, this word sounds nasty and bad to use against deity and against God. But as you consider the birth of Jesus, you see nothing else but an underdog. His family's mother tongue summoned memories of underdog status. You see, the, the, the mother tongue of Jesus was Aramaic. A R A M A I C. Is it Aramaic? Aramaic. Now, Aramaic was a trade language closely related to Arabs. Like it was a trade language. Can you imagine? So Jesus, at Akwana, they didn't have a mother tongue. They were using a trade language, lingua franca. You know what lingua franca? Lingua. Lingua franca, senor. A, a language that is used because of a particular setting. For example, trade. Doctors have their lingua franca. Teachers have their lingua franca. So the lingua franca of the mother tongue that Jesus was using was Aramaic, which was a trade language. That is an underdog kind of a mother tongue. Jews have their language. So why would they not use their language? That means Jesus was living closer to the border. He was a Galilean. Trade used to, in those days, trade used to happen along the borders. I when I'm history. Where did trade used to happen? Okay, in Kenya, in those prehistoric times, when where was trade? In Mombasa. Where is Mombasa? 
a border. So that should tell you that Jesus needs to live close to the border by the sea. So that the ship or the ship of Tashiki should come. And you maybe, maybe his parents were merchants. Like when they make the coffins, they make the beds, they used to sell him by the ship and go. So his mother tongue alone summons emotions of and status of mother tongue, like an underdog status. If that is not enough, the people who first came to see him, they were three wise men. Now these men were astrologers. Who are astrologers? They read stars. Senior. So the people who come to see the king of kings upon his birth are not even good people, magicians. So you are talking stars and become magicians. So imagine as a king of kings, the lord of lords and as a liwa, and of the people who come to see him is astrologers. It's like these days, the king of kings is born. Then the first people who go to see him, ni wachawi. No lambeleke zawadi. No a Christo waendi. I think to be that that's a picture of an underdog. Like he was so he, he was he was no he was no of no value. He reduced himself to such a degree. And you know, in those days, astrologers, like wise men, those who read the stars, they were considered unwise. In, according to the Jew, unclean rather. They were not allowed to come to the priest. They would not even come close to the high priest. But now this high priest is coming, and he's coming, and the people who first go to see him are those people who are not allowed religiously, they're not allowed to come and see him. Religiously speaking, Jesus is not supposed to associate with homosexuals. But the Jesus I know of, he's reduced himself to an underdog that he can even relate with them. He can tell them, you know what, I love you and I'm going to bring you out of this. I loved you and I still died on you on the cross. How about you think Jesus died only for you who is righteous? Jesus died for everyone. He died for sinners. He died for righteous people. And if anything, are you righteous? Our righteousness is as filthy rags before God. So he, he, the status of his arrival is just an underdog, underdog kind of a person. You see, naturally speaking, even today, the world are still, tell, are still tell towards the rich and powerful. If Jesus came as a rich boy, he would be born in the palace. The rich kid of, of Galilee. The rich kid of Galilee. Fresh prince. Fresh prince. Hey, hey, my designer, Viatu. Hey, madam, go gram. I'm going to post my my rich kid, Kenya, and I'm going to post Hey, my stay at Dubai, Buji Khalifa. Hey, I'm having breakfast at Kempinski. That's why I'm going to go KDF and i but Jesus knew that the world easily tilts towards the rich and the powerful. So he decided it's a game change. I'm not going to come through as a rich and powerful because fake people will follow me. I'm going to come through the opposite side. I'm going to come through as a poor person. A person who is less accepted in the society. A person who is not even accepted. An underdog. That's why when he was an underdog, many rejected him. If he was rich, many would have accepted him. But because he was poor, many rejected him. They said, he's not this one and his brothers here. Have we not seen a mother? Okay, let me show you that scripture if you think I'm, I'm speaking my own things. Uh, yeah, what, what is it called? Uh, are not his brothers with us here and his mother so and so? Is he not the one we've been seeing here? But what you didn't know that when he was coming in this direction, he was coming in a way to show us that he is concerned with the lowest of the lowest. I am an underdog just like you. So when you come to me, I'm approachable because I'm like you. If he, was, if he came through the rich and the powerful way of life, maybe most of us would not have approached him. Maybe Christianity would be for the rich. Maybe our relationship with him could be jeopardized because I don't have money to get to where he is. He is at Villa Rosa. When will I ever get money to go to Villa Rosa to hear him? But he came through an underdog channel. He came through nothing. They scoffed him just saying, he is just the carpenter's son. We know Mary, his mother, and his brothers, James, Joseph, and Simeon, and Judas. All his sisters live right here among us. Where did he learn these things? Like they scoffed him, saying, Ah, brother, tunakujua. Siwe babaka idawa kenudia. 
Tumbako dia nangko cukuna. Ana fanya ngap juzo ujinga ujinga Facebook. Siwan buda aku. But he came through such an avenue, an underdog kind of an avenue, so that he can go too low that he won't miss anyone. He stooped too low that he would not miss anyone. So he stooped that low to get to where you are. Number four and the last one. His birth is a display of courage. His love, okay, his birth is a display of courage. We see courage in him. You so it, it takes so much courage, I believe, for God to lay down his power and glory to a place among human beings who would greet him and treat him with a mixture of pride and skepticism. You see, being skeptical is being doubtful, right? So he lowered, he left his prestige, his glory, and lowered himself to a level of human beings who treat him with skepticism and doubt. How do you doubt the king of kings? You know he's God and you still doubt him. It takes so much courage. Anger to prove. Anger to Hey, I'm Jimmy in Superman. R2S. Hey, Jay. I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I'm going to Somebody save me! But he laid all that glory and power aside. And he came. You scoff him, he still does not reveal who he is. You abuse him, you spit on him, He's just okay. You slap him on this side, he gives you the other cheek. He tells his disciples, don't say who I am. Let them continue thinking who they are. I think it takes so much courage. Come and meet me in my small capacity. Anywhere I go, I want people to know I'm a pastor. Before you leave the gym, say, hey, my name is Pastor Boniface Bahati. How can I help you? You in your small capacity, you just enter somewhere. Hey, by the way, I have a degree. Now tell you what I want to relate to your degree. Maybe I'm going to get a degree, a degree of temperature. Well, I've given you a degree. Ah, I have a, I have a degree also, degree in economics. Yeah, I have a. De- <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? But he reduced himself. He lays, he lay aside his power and his glory to come and get to us. I think that's the highest display of power and glory. It took so much courage to come into a planet that is known for cruelty. Violence and rejecting prophets. Like in his days, Isaiah was rejected. Elijah was rejected and even killed by a woman. Jezebel. So he was coming into this earth knowing where I'm going, they reject prophets. Yeah. They are cruel. They are violent. They kill. It takes so much courage to know that where I'm going, I'm going to die and you still go there. It takes so much courage to know that they are about to betray me. You have power, but you don't use that power. You lay it aside and say, let me just go there. Let them do as they will. You know you have so much power that they cannot kill you. You even kill them. Jesus was saying, when Peter removed the sword and and, and cut the ear, he said, don't you know that I can call 5,000 angels? Just right now. So you protecting me is nothing. So he had so much power to call to someone. Just mm, a a legion. 5,000 would show up. And defend him. If once one angel terrifies the whole nation, how much for 5,000 angels? <laughs> but he laid aside all that glory and prestige and power to come down to our level and become human. It takes so much courage. Wow. When you look at his birth and you see who he is, you see he's a courageous person. You see he's an approachable person. You see him as an underdog, so you can easily relate to him. And you see him as a humble person. Yeah. Friend, it takes so much courage. To, lay a, to, to stand against scam, against gossip, against, sh- against backslash. It is like so denial. It is like so much courage. Why become okay gossip on to a video like me? I'm a pastor. Pastor, I guess they are talking about me. What are they talking about? They are talking about my shoes. <laughs> pastor, I guess they said my engineer are big. <laughs> pastor, it is like so much courage for him to stand against gossip. People were gossiping him, probably even like he's scared at the guy. Akano kale kam tuka Holy Ghost kamezaliwa. Akano kale kam tuka Holy Ghost. You see, he came through. No man had sex with the with the mother, so he came through the Holy Ghost kinda. Sindio. So when he was born, everyone was saying, "Hey, hey, hey. okay, mo Holy Ghost. Wakikuyu. Kujani mo Holy Ghost na tembea." So people were afraid of him. Come and see the guy who calls himself God. Come and see the guy who calls himself a prophet. 
come and see the crazy guy who calls himself Messiah. It just takes so much courage to stand against such. Jesus is a courageous person. So the Jesus I know of is different from the Jesus I was introduced to. The Jesus that I'm talking about right now is a courageous Jesus. He's a humble Jesus. He's an analog kind of a Jesus. Jesus. It takes so much courage to stand and say, even though they have rejected me, I still love them. You, once you are rejected, you walk out. Some of you reject us when we come to knock for an account, to welcome you to church. We will knock your doors. To can you a Jehovah Witness? You bang the door. It takes so much courage to stand and still look you in the eye and tell you it's okay, thank you for giving us the few minutes you've given us. And we walk away. Because the Jesus of courage is in us. Amen. The Jesus who stood against gossip. The Jesus who stood against scam. Yeah. He's still with us. Amen. So the reason why you're so fearful is because you don't have the Jesus of courage in you. If the Jesus of courage is in you, you will go through the storm, but still be courageous. You will know that this one is my enemy and still keep him. He kept, for crying out loud, he kept Judas and he knew Judas is going to betray me. But he kept him by his side. It takes so much courage to eat with your enemy in the same table. Without telling him, I know you are my enemy. Minus you, of course. It takes so much courage to stand up and tell your disciples, on the third day I'm going to be killed, and on the third day I'm going to resurrect. What if it doesn't happen? <laughs> what if we can die? No, shall I be You say it's one thing to say, then it fails to happen. It is, it's better you keep quiet. Give a nika one beer, as in you are better and like you say, it takes so much courage. That's why faith is for courageous people. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Yeah. It takes courage to declare. You see, the reason why you don't speak what I tell you, lift your offering and say, my offering is stronger. It's because you're not courageous. You don't believe what you say will come to pass. You don't believe that your seed can move your mountain. You don't believe that your offering, as little as it is, it can provoke God to change your status. You don't believe that your, your promise is greater than your problems. Yeah. You don't believe that because the Jesus of courage is not in you. But the Jesus I know of right now is different from the Jesus who they told me of. And this is the same Jesus I'm introducing to you. I'm introducing to you an underdog. I'm introducing to you a, a, an humble person. I'm introducing to you Jesus who, who, is, an, who is what? Approachable. He's not the Jesus who is not approachable. Friends, it takes so much courage to even stand up against your own family members. The Bible records that his own family wanted to put him away because they thought he had lost his mind. Imagine you've given birth to that baby. Then your, he, the baby now grows up and tells you, Mom, me, I'm God. The family rejected him. Uluguan at God. I've given birth to you. Come on, you know, Marco, you are a doctor. You are a doctor. You are a doctor. You are a doctor. You he takes courage to stand and say, my family may be against me, but I know who I am. I know the family of God is with me. This biological family may be standing against me, but that spiritual family is with me. Friends, it takes courage to stand and say, Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. You see, the need of such courage that Jesus had began on his first day on earth, on his first night on earth, and stayed till his last night on earth. It took courage to remain on that cross without using your power. It took courage. You know you can save yourself from that cross. Someone is coughing you on this side and telling you, if you are Lord, why don't you save yourself? It takes courage to say, yes, I am Lord. I have the ability to save myself, but I won't save myself. I'll remain as I am. The courage that he needed began on his first night on earth and continued to the very last day, the very last night on earth. 
it will take courage for you to survive through your faith. It will take courage for you to survive through your Christianity. That's why it says fear and tremble. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It will take courage for you to remain born again in this generation we are living in. If you're not ready to stand up for what you believe in, then be ready to die for anything that comes your way. Friends, it takes courage to follow Jesus. It takes courage to believe in Jesus. And Jesus has proved over and over that Jesus is the winner man.